Hello and welcome to Mining Network. We're joined again by Christopher Eccleston, our expert in all things specialty metals. Uh, Christopher, thanks again for coming back onto the programme. Thank you. Um, so today we're talking about antimony, which is uh, often referred to as the brother to tin. Um, it's not something that most people are, I'd imagine, um, very familiar with. So if you kick things off, um, what is antimony? What's its main uses in the market? Okay. Well, antimony, you've all seen in one of its manifestations, which is that um, it's been used as far back as the ancient Egyptians. And so the famous Egyptian eye with uh, all that mascara, that, you know, Cleopatra, etc. that was actually antimony that they used to use um, as uh, an original makeup. Um, but for most of the last few hundred years, antimony's main uses have been as um, an alloy with lead because everybody who knows lead knows it's very soft. So to harden it up, um, they used antimony as an alloy. And because of that, antimony was a major metal um, in uh, wartime situations because of the use of lead in uh, ammunition. And it's still used in ammunition, um, but it's become one of its secondary uses since um, really the 70s, 80s. Um, the uh, new application was flame retardants, fire retardants. So um, around 65% of all antimony um, is now used in um, flame and fire retardants. And it is um, the major um, flame retardant component in um, plastics and in textiles, construction materials, um, those type of things. So it's, it's become really important in that space. So it's all around you, uh, you just don't know it's there. Particularly, um, you know, the best example is in your car, all the side panels, a dashboard all around you and um, you've got all this plastic um, and of course plastic burns like crazy um, in a fire situation and so um, most of those panels that have got around you are actually like six percent antimony um, six seven percent because at those levels um, if there is a fire um, the antimony component um, uh, slows down the fire it doesn't stop it um, but it can also you know potentially stop things from catching fire um, in, a, in a situation like that. And then they're the main uses. Uh, there are uses in electronics, um, in uh, some chips. Uh, but the, the usage, you know, as or anything to do with chips, it's all micro, so the usage is pretty small. Um, and the big new usage, which we'll talk about later, is in antimony molten salt batteries, which is the new technology in uh, mass storage devices. Um, up there competing or um, complementing, dare I say, um, vanadium and vanadium redox flow batteries. So that's uh, that's the main usage of antimony. There's, uh, there's some in the lead acid batteries as well because of the lead component. But most much of that is recycled. So it's sort of like a bit of a, a closed circuit um, there in, in lead acid batteries. We, yeah, as you say, we'll want to go on to the battery side of this as well in, in a moment. I did read a report recently saying that in 2020, the market size was around 2 billion US dollars. Does that sound about right? Probably better to not talk in terms of the market size in, in dollar terms to talk about the absolute size, which is 170,000 tons a year. Because what has happened um, is over the last 12 months, the price of antimony has gone from 5,500 a ton to now topping in the last week 13,000 a ton. So whatever the size of the market was a year ago, it's now um, like 130% bigger than it was back then. So um, if it was 2 billion, it'd be now five. But um, really the best way of calculating is just multiplying 170,000 by um, 13,000, and then you'll have the, um, have the big number. And so it's, it's a big market now, uh, very big, not as big as 10, um, but uh, very sizable. And, and there is a shortage situation has broken out, and that's what um, propelled the, um, the price, amongst other things, to this, uh, this current level. With this shortage, um, is, this, is this more due to the supply side of this market? And if you don't mind, where, yeah. is, where is most of the supply coming from? Mainly from the supply side, um, because uh, China has been the biggest producer of antimony for a very long time, since before the First World War. And uh, China's been probably the world's largest producer since like the 1850s. So um, China has, this is the metal that China has dominated the longest. When no one even knew about rare earths, China was dominating antimony. 
um, didn't really matter to the rest of the world because they could get their supplies from there. And there were a lot of mines outside China. Um, but really since the 1980s, uh, predatory pricing by the Chinese has driven away most of the production outside China. And so China ended up uh, not only being the largest processor, but also the largest miner with something between 80 to 90% of the market. Um, what's happening in recent times though is that Chinese production has been in a secular decline because they have one really big mine that um, has been sometimes 30% of the global production. And that's a really old mine, it goes back to 1500s in fact. And it's, um, it's got shrinking production. The Chinese also shut down um, some polluting mines and some polluting processing plants. And so Chinese share of mine production has fallen from nearly 90% down to probably around 60%. And they've been making up the difference so that they can keep their processing dominance going by buying up artisanal products, which they've been uh, sort of ripping out of Burma, Laos, Honduras, uh, Bolivia, um, sort of 30 worldy locations that they can um, do a bit of predatory buying, uh, snap up the product from, you know, micro producers, and then take it back to the mothership for processing. And so that is how they've managed to maintain their dominance in the processing space, where they still have probably 90% of the global um, processing capacity. It doesn't seem too sustainable, obviously, especially in places like Myanmar, where, where there is conflict, yep. that you're going to have issues. Absolutely. Like well, there are several motives for the rise. One is the secular decline in Chinese production. Two is the coup in Burma, which happened um, late last year. Um, three, there was all the dislocation that was caused by the, um, the pandemic um, into shipping, uh, to containers. You know, at the moment, for instance, there's a $1,000 premium per ton for product delivered into the US over the product delivered to Rotterdam. And then there's a, a similar type of uh, uh, premium between a product out of ports in China and at Rotterdam. So, um, Definitely shipping has had a, a, a big impact on um, shipping dislocation, had a big effect upon the um, situation. But you know, we can't forget the demand side where for a number of years, um, there was a sword dangling over the head of uh, the Antony market in the form of um, fears that uh, regulators in the EU and in some US states were going to crack down on the use of Antony as a fire retardant in, um, in clothing, uh, specifically children's pajamas, which is like a micro fraction of uh, the antimony market. But that was one of the things that kept the price down around five and a half thousand. Um, but really last year, the, all the regulators realized that uh, there was no replacement for antimony in these, these pajamas. It was either you put it in the pajamas um, and you know face the risk, or you end up <laughs> with the children um, inflammable pajamas, which do you prefer? And so the regulators stepped back and that then um, took away a, a threat that had been dangling over the uh, Antigone uh, fire retardant market for a long time. And um, that then brought, uh, you know, renewed buyers into the space. Everyone was de-stocked as well after the pandemic. So there was no, there was no product lying around um, spare. Just quickly on, on demand, because we did touch on that very quickly there. Um... I, I believe you, we we spoke before, and, and you you were mentioning around two three percent growth per annum in yeah. the antimony market, and in years gone by, has that changed this year? And are you expecting that to be changing in the years to come? The growth in the space has been steady, so been like the growth in you know Western GDP, so it's like two or three percent a year, um, sometimes a bit lower, sometimes a bit higher. Um, particularly back in 2014, 2012, when the price spiked last. 14,000, there was quite a bit of replacement um, going on in the space. Um, but as much as could be replaced has been replaced. So now we're um, sort of like at a rock bottom there. So the growth in that space uh, of flame retardants, batteries, uh, uh, you know, uh, lead acid batteries and, and ammunition is, is pretty stable, just trending upwards. The big new usage, though, um, is potentially the molten salt batteries. Now, the judges are out on... Um, how big this will be, um, if it'll be big at all. Um, but if it is um, gaining traction as a mass storage mode, then the potential to light a fire under um, demand 
is big. But, you know, the problem there would be that um, that if the price, like in vanadium, uh, goes too high, then the application doesn't get traction because it becomes unviable as a, um, as a means of storage. Um, you know, the, the molten salt batteries, if we can briefly digress into those, yeah. are primarily used um, for on-grid and off-grid storage of large amounts of electricity in uh, off-peak periods. So whereas, um, for instance, you might have um, uh, solar and wind are very regular. Well, we know when the sun shines, um, that the sun doesn't always shine, <laughs> particularly in Britain. Um, so, uh, you know, you store it when you can, but that's not necessarily when the users want the electricity. And, you know, the peak periods for most users are between like 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. So if you can generate um, wind or, um, or solar and um, put it into large storage devices, then you can release it to the grid later on in the, um, the day, the night, when um, the real demand is there. And so that's, um, that's the primary application of these things. But out of the moment, um, for instance, you know, the largest... Um, current applications out in the desert of Nevada where there's a, a really big solar array and they are storing um, uh, the power that they generate off the solar array onto um, uh, molten salt batteries. Do you, do you see these as a competitor um, to the redox flow batteries? Redox flow batteries are more off-grid um, than uh, the anti-molten salt. Um, they're very different, uh, primarily in the pricing as well, because the problem that vanadium has had is that its price, as we mentioned in our talk the other day, have, has often oscillated between $6 and $30 from time. And uh, when it goes above $10, in theory, um, you know, the battery operators um, you know, just stop making the batteries because they claim that it's unviable. Um, antimony at $14,000 um, or $13,000, as it is at the moment, is okay. If it went above 15, I think it would, might actually, um, you know, choke, choke off the demand uh, for development of the molten salt batteries because it would become too expensive. There's a little statistic out there where the largest um, developer of these batteries has said that um, for each gigawatt hour of um, storage capacity in molten salt batteries, uh, 1% or 1,700 tonnes of an antimony is uh, required for each gigawatt of storage. Um, so out of 170,000 tonnes a year, that's uh, only 1%. But if you suddenly had demand for 10 gigawatts of storage, that would be 10% of the global demand. And so um, if antimony molten salt um, gets traction and starts to um, uh, absorb multiple gigawatts of um, antimony uh, product, into its um, into its uh, uh, demand, then um, we could be seeing a lot higher growth than um, the, the you know the rather tepid um, demand um, increments from um, you know just fire retards. So it's anybody's guess how how much it could be, but it's it's not going down. Let's put it that way. Well, it sounds like a contender. I mean, it, like you said, it's it doesn't need to be off grid like vanadium, and it also has the perks of um, I guess not not being subject to cold weather or or particularly hot weather as well, um, exactly. which which is a great benefit for a battery. Not not yes. many batteries can claim that. Yes, um, no, particularly lithium ion batteries do not operate well in um, in cold weather environments, and then in hot weather environments they can spontaneously combust. So it's sort of like lose lose situation with lithium ion batteries when they're out in the elements. Whereas um, these lithium, uh, these antimony molten salt batteries, you know, make their own heat in the cold environments, and uh, they don't catch fire in the hot ones because um, they're hot already. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's true. And just really quickly, because I know I know we are short on time, but could you just um, break down the chemistry or sort of what's actually in um, these molten salt batteries? Obviously, there's the antimony, but um, how, what what else is actually um, in there as as well? well? Well, quite a lot of that is, uh, is, is proprietary um, because uh, the main uh, developer of these uh, batteries is this company, Ambry. Uh, Ambry was founded by a professor at MIT uh, around a bit over 10 years ago um, with the backing of Bill Gates um, of Microsoft, obviously, and Vinod Kosler of Sun Microsystems. Since then, they've done another big financing with um, Reliance Industries of India, the massive conglomerate, 
and Paulson, the massive uh, New York hedge fund, throwing in the money. So you've got pretty powerful backers behind it, but they don't want their um, their secret source uh, bandied around. Um, I know bits about it, um, but it does include magnesium as well. Um, so it's it's a different chemistry um, set to um, what you've got with lithium-ion batteries, and it definitely doesn't have cobalt, um, which is an advantage. <laughs> Good. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Christopher. We'll, we'll leave it there. But um, for anyone not familiar with Christopher's work, we have done a few other videos on vanadium and tin, so check those out. And I'll also be putting links to Christopher's independent research on mining companies and commodities in the description below. Christopher, thanks again. Thank you very much.